all about Russialization. My name is Dan Rielli, and I'm interested in human behavior. I'm interested in rationality and irrationality. I'm interested in the cases in which we make good decisions and the cases in which we make bad decisions. But they'll do first the roles constraint, and then they'll do the real one. Together with colleagues and students, we run hundreds of experiments to try and understand human behavior. And in the last few years, we've been focusing on dishonesty. We watch corporate scandals everywhere. Enron, WorldCom, the financial crisis of 2008. We saw an increase in cheating in professional sports. Have you ever used steroids? No. I have never used steroids. I have never doped. We witnessed political deception and its huge repercussions. Does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? No, sir. It does not. Not wittingly. On one hand, we want to look at the mirror and think that we are good, honest, wonderful people. On the other hand, we want to benefit selfishly from being dishonest. As long as we cheat just a little bit, we don't have to pay any price in terms of the image and the way we view ourselves. And we call this the fudge factor. So this is the ability to misbehave and think of ourselves as good people. And you can think about all kinds of ways in which in your own life you have a fudge factor. The speed limit. Maybe it says 55, but are you okay in driving 60? What about cheating a little bit on taxes? What about exaggerating their online dating profile? <laughs> Across many studies, we find that everything that changes the fudge factor also changes people's ability to be dishonest. There are dozens of elements that can change the magnitude of the fudge factor. And we've been able to observe many of them in the lab. For example, if you can say to yourself, everybody is doing it, it's easier for you to rationalize to yourself that this is actually an okay thing to do and cheat to a higher degree. My name is Garrett Bauer. I'm 44 years old, and I used to be a professional stock trader. I love trading. It was more fun than almost anything. Doing a really smart trade was more important to me than even making money. When I first moved to New York, I uh, met my first friend, and his name was Ken. I knew he knew a lawyer. Uh, Matthew Kluger. I worked at a very prestigious firm that represented some of the biggest names in corporate America. I had known Ken Robinson for a couple of years. We talked to each other on the phone. He said, so you're working on these high-profile deals? And I said, yes. He said, so let me get this straight. You kind of get to read tomorrow's paper today. And he said, you know, that information could be valuable to someone. And I said, yeah, but it's very risky. It's highly illegal. Ken said, I have a friend who's a big day trader who could take that information and use it to great advantage, but could probably avoid detection because he does a lot of day trading. We set up a meeting on the street corner and talked for maybe an hour. By just entering into a discussion of the possibility of doing this, I was crossing the line, but it didn't feel like that at that point. Bauer put me at ease that what we were doing, though wrong, was A, common, and B, not really hurting anybody. Insider trading information is passed around. If it's not daily, it's weekly. There are a lot of people out there who are becoming privy to inside information and using it to trade. Everyone's trading on this stuff. There wasn't one person in my office that wasn't. I passed information, and the scheme gelled. Matt would call Ken with information somewhat like we think IBM is buying Sun Microsystems. Then they would tell me how many shares. We'd subtract the tax rate, I'd pay the taxes, and then they would get the cash. I did not expect it to take on a life of its own. And then it took on a life of its own. One night, Ken called me and said his house had been raided. 
I don't remember everything he said on that call, but I remember thinking that some of what he said was a little suspicious and was wondering, is it possible someone is listening? But I dismissed that as being paranoia. What about the information at the law firm? That's what I worry about. Like, when you did searches or I don't know how you did it. I don't. If they had that, they would have been here already. There's a big difference between what they know is probably a lie and what they think they can prove is a lie. They go to court without phone calls, without a trail, without a, this happened at this time. Right. They, they just don't have any of that. Right. And I was arrested the next morning. I sit up out of bed and I hear someone say, um, Garrett Bauer, where are you? Clearly, I'm thinking it's pretty serious when you have that many FBI agents in your apartment. Federal prosecutors have charged two men with an insider trading scheme that went on for 17 years. Our investigation has documented more than $109 million in illegal trades. Bauer and Kluger pleaded guilty to securities fraud, conspiracy to commit money laundering, and obstructing justice. In order to study dishonesty, we need to be able to measure, hopefully precisely, the extent to which people are dishonest. So we have all kinds of methods. I'll describe one of them. You can just have a seat anywhere with a packet and a pen in front of it. We gave people 20 simple math problems. Find the two numbers that add up to 10. These are problems that everybody could solve if they had enough time, but we don't give people enough time. We are going to give you five minutes to solve as many as possible. At the end of the five minutes, please stop. Put your pencil down and count how many questions you got correctly. And now that you know how many questions you got correctly, take the sheet of paper, go to the front of the room, and shred it. People do that, they come to the front, they say they solve six problems, pay them six dollars, they go home. There you go, thank you for participating. What the people in the experiment don't know is that we played with the shredder. The shredder shred the size of the page, but the body of the page remains intact. <laughs> and what do we find? On average, people solve four problems and report to be solving six. I solved six. I don't know if this is embarrassing or not, but I got six. I believe I got seven right. We've ran these experiments on 40,000 people. And so far, we found about 20 big cheaters. Those are people who cheated all the way, said they solved 20 problems, and they stole $400 from us. And we also found about 20-some thousand little cheaters, and they stole about $50,000 from us. And I think this is not a bad reflection of reality. Yes, there are some big cheaters out there, but they are very rare. And because of that, their overall economic impact is relatively low. On the other hand, we have a ton of little cheaters. And because there are so many of us, the economic impact of small cheating is actually incredibly, incredibly high. I think having a first affair definitely makes a second affair easier because you've already been there and done that. You um, you know that you can get away with it, you know, because you did before. I think a really important skill is to be good at lying. So, like, <laughs> if you do it in, like, a really good way, <laughs> you don't have to worry about them catching you. So that's why I think it's good to be good at lying. Uh -huh. Sometimes you also have to lie in a way because you're making somebody happy. Like, if you're throwing a surprise birthday party, then that means they're ob obviously trying to help and get ready or do something. And so you're lying to your friend to help them have a good birthday. All creatures 
uh, big or small, uh, have deception as part of their armamentary. Oftentimes it's just survival. You know, a plant or a bird might change color and camouflage itself, which is a form of deception. The bigger the brain, the larger the capacity to lie. Chimpanzees, for example, have been known to lie where they may lead their group away from where the food is so that that one particular chimpanzee can come back to the food later on and find that food. It's very common for children, younger children, to, to fib. And for them, it gives them pleasure. It helps them imagine things, and it helps them build their brain and helps them build what is called the theory of mind, a psychological theory by which, as our brains mature, we're able to predict and imagine what the other person's thinking about. And unless children lie and unless children imagine and dream big, they may not have the full capacity to develop a theory of mind. In one project, Dan and I decided to look at what's the influence of others' unethical behavior on our own decisions to cheat. So we designed an experiment with different type of conditions. So imagine the same experiment I described to you before, but with one main difference. We hired an acting student, and 30 seconds into the experiment, he raised his hand. Yeah, I, I got all of them. Can I, what do I do? And they say, I solved everything, what do I do next? I uh, sure, come up here. I'm done. Now, this is 30 seconds into the experiment. You are still on question number one. <laughs> There is no question in your mind that that person is cheating, and the experimenter said, you finished everything, you're free to go. There you go. Thanks very and much. And you see that person taking all the amount of money and going home. What would happen to your own morality? Well, lots more people cheat. But there could be two explanations here. One explanation is we just prove to people that in this experiment there's no downside for cheating. The second possibility is that it's not about the fact that they wouldn't catch you, it's about the fact that it's actually socially okay. Thank you for participating. And so we decided to study this by looking at whether the person cheating is somebody like us, or somebody we feel similar to, or somebody who's very different from us. We ran this experiment at Carnegie Mellon. Everybody was a Carnegie Mellon student, the acting student was a Carnegie Mellon student. We dressed the acting student in the University of Pittsburgh sweatshirt. <laughs> now, what happens if you're a University of Carnegie Mellon student and a Pittsburgh student cheats? <laughs> you still know that you can get away with it. Here's the proof that somebody goes home with all their money. But you don't think that people like you are doing it. And what happens now? Cheating goes down. So it's not about the probability of being caught. It's about the question of what is socially acceptable in our circle. My name is Erica Nelson. I am from Florida. I'm married to my husband, Kenny. And we have a total of six children. Him and I have two children together. He has a really good heart, and we had a really good relationship. We handle anything. We put them to the ultimate test. Dads alone with their babies at nap time after a very full feeding. Can the leak stay locked through a long milk-induced slumber? No leaks here. Grab a dad and see for yourself. How compared to Pampers Baby Dry, Huggies all new Snug and Dry stops leaks. But to go from nothing to having six children, you know, it was a lot. <laughs> You know, it was all about, like, the kids and then his work, and that was really it. And I was just kind of, you know, wiping butts from the moment I got up to the moment I went to bed, and that was kind of my life. Good day, I had a bra on. <laughs> that was my dress-up day. I kind of just got lost in that. And we weren't having sex, we weren't, um, we weren't even talking, but I really loved my husband and I wanted to make it work. So I would try to talk to him and no matter what I say, it doesn't seem to get through to him. Nothing changes. I even went to him crying the last time and I said, look, I need more than this, you know, in my life. And I love you enough to tell you this because I don't want to ruin this. 
And um, he was like, eh. <laughs> Not that he was indifferent. I just think that he thought, eh, you know, we'll get through it. I didn't take it like that. I took it as a slap in the face. Ashley Madison is a website for married people or people that are in a committed relationship that want to have random sex or hookups or whatever. I think that that's an appeal to Ashley Madison. You know that everybody knows that you're married, you know, so there's not that awkwardness. You check your area, and we live in a small little community, and there's like, you know, hundreds of people on there. And it's, it's easy to kind of mask um, the reality of what you're doing, too, because you're behind a computer screen. I talked to one guy. We had actually a really, we had like a pretty good friendship um, for a few months. And then it got more into like intimate conversations and talks, and then let's meet up. He would take me to fancy restaurants, I would get dressed up. And I'm thinking, wow, this would be awesome. I could have like this whole home life and then I could, you know, and be the good parent, be the good mom. Then I can have this whole other life of jet setting and, you know, wearing bras and dressing up and wearing makeup and doing your hair. Polar opposite of what I had going on at home. And I think that I almost was more attracted to that than anything else. And I would lie and say that I was just gonna go to hang out with my friend or I was gonna go, you know, visit my parents or whatever, you know, to see him. So I think, I think that even when you know it's wrong, the immediate gratification suffocates what you know is right. So I came home one night and I asked my husband, are you going out of town this week at all? And he said, why? So you can talk to him on the phone, why I'm not here? And I just said, how did you find out? And then he kind of walked away, and then I followed him upstairs. I didn't know how long he had known. I didn't know what he knew. So all these questions went in my head. And he said, you left up an email. And he said, you know, I came in the office, and the email was there from the night before. And I read all of them. And I said, look, you know, I was going to get attention or whatever from somebody else. As, as messed up as that is, that's how I am. And, and I can't, I don't know how to get over that. So I need like your help or I need somebody's help. I said, but I don't want to mess this up between us. I saw how hurt he was and my husband didn't deserve it. And um, I deleted my account that day. of mine he was looking at the lines in the NBA games and he just asked me to help him pick some winners and being an NBA referee I knew certain teams were going to be at an advantage or a disadvantage and I picked some games for him and it was just a, a situation where I crossed a line that I shouldn't have been near On the computer screen, you will see a square. It will be divided into two. There'll be a right half and a left half. We're going to flash some dots in this square just for half a second. Your task, if you were a participant in the experiment, is just to tell me which side of the line has more dots. And it's usually pretty obvious which side. There's like a lot here and not very many here. Now, there's one more thing. We're not going to pay you the same amount for the right and for the left. But regardless of the amount, your task is to basically be as accurate and truthful as possible. Ready? Go. The dot task is a basic experiment in conflicts of interest. Very, very few people start by lying egregiously. But if the dots are kind of similar, just slightly more to the left, they would say right. Almost any moral conflict you can think of as there's a line <laughs> and you have to decide whether you're going to cross it or not. You kind of want to go to the other side and you kind of know what the right side is. Maybe I'll go to the other side sometimes.
My name is Tim Dunnegy. I grew up in Havertown, Pennsylvania. My father was a college basketball official, and because of that and because of my love of sports, you know, I followed in his footsteps and pursued a career as an NBA basketball referee. That's about as good a defense as you can get. I started the referee, uh, you know, based on the rules and how they're written in the rule book. Tim Donaghy, the rookie official, is calling it very tight here in the early going. A lot of offensive fouls and picks, so they're calling it by the rule book. Unfortunately, I saw some people that were moving up a little bit quicker than me. I learned from the veterans that there's a certain craft and a certain way that you have to do things in order to advance. And, you know, they'll tell you, certain players are given the benefit of maybe traveling with the basketball rather than other players. Certain uh, players are getting the benefit of not having that critical foul called on them that would send them to the bench. Rubio gets a look. Good if it goes. Oh, my gosh. That's just a horrible call by Jason Phillips, who did not have the courage to call that against Kobe Bryant. Wow. Just an awful no call. It's probably about 50-50 when you, when you look at calls that are enforced by the rule book and then calls that are made or not made based on star treatment, pressure from coaches at certain times. What changed those last few minutes for you guys? The guys with the whistles. I've never had conversations with the commissioner about what to call in a game and what not to call in a game, but from the operations department, they clearly dictate uh, through video, through emails, through meetings what they want called and what they don't want called. And it always seems to revolve around the star players or the big market teams. Kobe Bryant's a star in this league. He puts a lot of people in the stands, he sells a lot of sneakers, and he sells a lot of jerseys. And uh, the fans played an enormous amount of money to sit in those uh, courtside seats, and they want those type of players on the floor. That's who they came to see. I don't think the officials feel that they're doing something that's not right because in their minds, they're being told what to do from the league office. And if they're going to continue to advance and get those big playoff bonus checks, you're going to do what the league wants. Being an NBA referee and being involved in the planning of how the game was going to be called that night, I knew certain teams were going to be at an advantage or a disadvantage. And it was just a, a situation where I crossed a line that I shouldn't have been near. Never forget when the first situation arose, a friend of mine was looking at the lines in the NBA games, and he just asked me to help him pick some winners. And I remember I was looking at the master schedule of referees that night, and I knew who was refereeing certain games, and I, and I picked some games for him. And the games did very well, and he called me the next day, and, you know, we just had a frank, frank conversation. I knew a, a certain line was way off, or I knew a certain re referee was, uh, you know, going to give special treatment to a certain owner, team, or individual player. So I passed that information along to my buddy, and he was kind of shocked that I could predict the outcome of a game. We would discuss certain games that we both liked, and because of my contract with the NBA, I wasn't allowed to place a bet of any kind, so he would contact the bookies and put everything under his name for both of us. It got to the point where we were gambling probably three or four games a week in the NBA. At, um, as time went on, I, I started to feel guilty about doing it, and you know, basically I wanted to stop. What I didn't realize is, is my good friend was passing this information along to people that were associated with organized crime. And they were basically betting an enormous amount of money based on the information that I was giving him. They picked me up outside a hotel in Philadelphia and basically took me for a ride in, in the car and made it known that, that they had been getting that information and pics were gonna continue to come and if not, somebody would visit my wife and kids down in Florida. So my quick thoughts were uh, to, to play ball with them a little bit, and, and hopefully at the end of this coming season, they would release me from the grips and, and make enough money to where, you know, we could all just wash our hands of this and, and be done with it and never do it again, and I could continue to keep my job and just move in a different direction.
What happens is, as the season ends, I'm back home in Sarasota, Florida, getting ready to play golf. And I get a call from a, uh, a friend of mine who tells me that the FBI has been knocking on a lot of people's doors and that uh, the whole scheme was discovered over uh, a Gambino wiretap and that uh, they were asking a lot of questions. Today, former NBA referee Tim Dunahy is expected to plead guilty in federal court in connection with allegations that he bet on games in which he officiated. Our brain gets accustomed to lying because after a while, the negative value of lying, the negative feeling, um, is just not there so much. I was sitting in the lounge, charging my phone, and all of a sudden you hear the announcement, your flight's about to take off. So I run out, and I get to my flight, and I sit in my seat, and then I realize as the door is closing, my phone is in the charger in the lounge. I run up to the girls in the front, the stewards, and which you must sit down, miss. We're just taking off. You must. No, you can't. My phone's in the lounge. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Listen, I work with CNN News. I'm on the air tomorrow, and I need to have my phone because everything that I've just worked on is sitting in this phone. So I guess what? The plane went back. They got my phone. A woman hands me my phone, and everyone in the place looks at me and goes, what the f is that? We kind of anecdotally know that once you lie, you're more likely to lie again. And probably the second lie will be bigger than the first. What we find in the brain is that, at the beginning, if you lie a little bit, there's a huge response in regions involved in emotion, such as the amygdala and the insula. The tenth time you lie, even if you lie the same amount, the response is not that high. So while lying goes up over time, the response in your brain goes down. We think that the reason that this happens is because of a very basic principle of the brain, which is the brain adapts. For example, if you're listening to music and it's quite low volume, and I turn it up like two notches, it will feel like a really big difference, right? But if you're listening to the radio and it's really high volume, and then I put it up two notches, you won't even feel it. The brain is coding everything relative to what the baseline is. The same goes with dishonesty. If we're pretty much honest people and we haven't lied and now we're telling a lie, the brain is coding this as a really big difference relative to our baseline. But if we are dishonest and we can handle anything, we put them to the ultimate test. Dads, alone with their babies at nap time after a very full feeding. Can the leak stay locked through a long, milk-induced slumber? The leak's here. Grab a dad and see for yourself how compared to Pampers Baby Dry, how these all-new Snug and Dry stops leaking. The brain doesn't respond so much. After a while, the negative value of lying, the negative feeling, um, is just not there so much, which kind of makes you just lie more and more and more. For a split second, for a split second, I said, I can fix this. And then the totality of, of what I had done, had just, it was just coming crashing down. I mean, there's, there was no way that I could fix it. We did a study with 12,000 golf players. We said, imagine the ball fell on the rough, not a good place, and you really, really wanted it to be four inches to the left. Would you pick it up and move it four inches? And people said, heaven forbid. You understand the nature of the game, how people feel about it? Nobody would do that. Fine, nobody does that. What about kicking the ball? No problem whatsoever. <laughs> 
What about hitting it with a club? It's even easier. And you know what's the easiest? If you're not looking. Like, you look up, and then you kick a little bit. <laughs> but I think you can feel the intuition that if you pick something up and you moved it, the act would feel incredibly deliberate. But if there was some distance, you kicked it, something happened, all of a sudden, this distance would allow people to have a bit more ambiguity in the connection between them and the final act. So imagine this, the same experiment I described earlier. You fill in your sheets, you solve these little problems, you shred the piece of paper, and you come to the experimenter. You tell them how much money you deserve. You tell it in tokens. I solve X problems, I deserve X tokens. So now you pay them in pieces of plastic. They take this piece of plastic, walk 12 feet to the side, and change it for dollars. So when somebody looks you in the eyes and they lie, they don't lie for money, they lie for something else, but that thing becomes money very quickly. What happened? In our experiment, people doubled their cheating. There you go. Thank you. This, by the way, is the most troubling result I think we got. Think about it. In a society, we're moving away from money. Credit cards, stock, stock options, derivatives, dealing with people over great distances. Could it be that as these distances and all of their versions are increasing, people find it easier to misbehave and still think of themselves or ourselves as good people? And I think the answer is absolutely, absolutely yes. My name is Walt Pavlo. I grew up in uh, Savannah, Georgia. I worked for MCI, a very large telecommunications company. I was a bill collector. And they weren't telephone bills you and I open up each month. They were for large companies. While I was managing customers that were paying their bill on time, I was getting a small number of customers that were involved in things like 900 business. Those types of companies aren't exactly good business people. One company owed MCI in excess of like $50 million. And um, I took this to my management and said, well, what, what do I do with this guy? He owes us $50 million. We have to, in accounting terms, do a write-off. Just really tell our shareholders that, you know, that $50 million that we've, we were expecting from this customer, it's not going to come in. And instead, I was told, we're not going to tell anybody about it. We're going to leave it on MCI's accounting records, and we're going to do some, some uh, cooking of the books, if you will, to allow this debt to be put off into the future. So it looks like it's going to be collected at some other time. The ability for me to, to move numbers around was something that I knew that was wrong, but at the same time, it took a lot of pressure off of me. And before I knew it, I had moved around or not told shareholders about probably $100 million worth of debt that wasn't on MCI's books. And it really is, is, is that simple. I mean, it's just, a, it's just an accounting entry. It's just a number. I felt a sense that it wasn't going to be very much longer, that there are ways to undo this and you know, turn the clock backwards in, in a few months. And then I realized that it's, this isn't going to happen. <laughs> you know, customers still aren't paying us. The amount of money that I've manipulated is getting larger. I'm working for a company that doesn't care the pressure that they put me under. So I confided in somebody outside of MCI and said, hey, I, you know, I'm looking for some advice. What do I do in this situation? He says, Walt, I, I have an idea. I think that there's a way that we can get some of these customers to pay MCI's debts. That solves your other problem in that you're actually going to see money coming in again. And then third, Walt, I think I can make you and I a hell of a lot of money doing this. And I was like, what was number three again? I felt a sense of empowerment, you know, really cockiness. You know, if there's money involved, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm doing this, yeah. I, you know, this is the way this is supposed to work. Hi, Walt. Hi. This is pretty cool. Real cool. I can tell you, that feeling didn't last very long. I went down to the Cayman Islands. I went on a private jet, and a guy hands me a lot of money, and I'm like, oh my God, what is this? What have I done? 
How far have I, have I taken this thing? No more. I don't want to do this anymore. Six months after that, um, I get received a call from uh, my boss. Somebody from accounting has called me and told me something's wrong with one of the accounting entries, and they need an explanation for it. For a split second, for a split second, I said, I can fix this. And then the totality of, of what I had done, it, just, it was just coming crashing down. I mean, there's, there was no way that I could fix it. I've been caught. And this is what I think corruption is all about. It's not about being bad, it's about being human. And because of that, it means that we all need to think about how do we protect ourselves against our own bad behavior and the bad behavior of other people. We went to a bar in Washington, D.C where congressional staffers hang out in. And we went to a bar in New York City where bankers hang out. So who cheats more, the bankers or the politicians? <laughs> who votes for bankers? Who votes for politicians? OK, many more for politicians. The bankers cheated twice as much. <laughs> you can't be happy with this result. Like, there's no, <laughs> there's no way that this is a good result. If we took all the elements that we studied and we combined them into one environment, we would get an environment that is very similar to the one that operated in the financial crisis of 2008. Not in generations has Wall Street absorbed the number of body blows it took today. Three of the five biggest investment banks are gone. The country's biggest mortgage lender is gone. We had politicians, bankers, regulators, and even investors, all influenced by many factors. Self-deception, social norms, distance from money, lying for the benefits of others, and of course, conflicts of interest. And this is what I think corruption is all about. It's about that when you get into a system and something in the system tells you that things are wrong there, all of a sudden you abandon your own moral fiber. And because of that, we really need to figure out what can we do about it? How can we get people to behave better? Because if we don't, we're just going to get more and more disasters like the one we've just experienced. Many of the experiments that we have conducted are about trying to find ways to curb dishonesty. We went to UCLA and we asked about 500 undergrads to try and recall the Ten Commandments. We asked people to write down as many of the Ten Commandments as they could remember. And then we put them in a situation where they could cheat with the matrix task. How many of them do you think recalled all Ten Commandments? Zero, Zero that's right. <laughs> By the way, they invented lots of interesting ones. <laughs> what happened after people tried to recall the Ten Commandments, even if they were unsuccessful? Nobody cheated. It wasn't as if the people who remembered more commandments, the people who are presumably more religious, cheated less, and the people who remembered Almost none of them cheated more. Nobody cheated. It didn't matter what religion the participants had. You know what the Ten Commandments are about. They are about a moral code. They are about proper behavior. And just knowing that and being reminded of that decreases dishonesty. In fact, even when we take self-declared atheists and ask them to swear in the Bible, they stop cheating. It is not about heaven and hell and being caught. It's about reminding ourselves about our own moral fiber. We found this result to be very promising, but we wanted to test it in a non-religious context. So we went to MIT, and we did a similar experiment with honor codes. So we got students at MIT to sign the honor code. I understand that this short study falls under the MIT honor code. They did it, shredded a piece of paper. What happened? No cheating whatsoever. And no cheating whatsoever, despite the fact that MIT doesn't have an honor code. <laughs> then we replicated the experiment at Princeton. Princeton has a very strong honor code. In fact, the freshmen get a whole week of a crash course on morality, lectures, discussion. So we took the Princeton students, 
signing the honor code and not signing the honor code, the MIT students signing the honor code or not. Was there any difference? No. When they did not sign the honor code, they both cheated to the same level. When they signed the honor code, none of them cheated. And I think this is kind of a mixture of good news and bad news. The bad news is the crash course on morality, particularly the Princeton version, doesn't seem to have any effect two weeks down the road. The good news is that even without a crash course, reminding people about their own moral fiber does change how people behave. It took me a long time to come to grips with the fact that I was going to go to prison. And it wasn't because I didn't know that I was guilty. I mean, I knew that I, for sure that I was. I knew that what I had done is wrong, and I wanted to make it right. But what I couldn't come to face with was the consequences. I had to fall on the uh, sword and let everybody know that I basically screwed up and I made some terrible, terrible choices. I regret it all. I mean, because I, I would like to be honest with my girls and tell them, you know, that I went the higher route and that I didn't cheat and that, you know, one wrong doesn't make a right and preach all that to them. But I can't. I mean, if my girls ask me about my infidelity, I'm going to be honest with them because it's who I am and I need to own it. Well, when I do get out of jail, my brother said he will help me, but I just don't know what I'm going to do at all. Uh, I figured I have a lot of time to think about that.